Uh, hello, everyone, and, and welcome back to the VGL Symposium. This is the final panel on the symposium. I'm Mark James. I'm a adjunct professor at Vermont Law School and a senior fellow at the Institute for Energy and the Environment. Um, and I will be moderating today's panel on protecting uh, the grid. Um, we've been talking about throughout today about transitioning and bringing in fairness um, into our energy transitions. One of the things where this panel is going to focus on is how do we how do we protect that as our grid becomes increasingly digitized as we rely more upon uh, third party vendors using cloud based services. Think about how do we connect together technologies. I remember from one of the earlier panels they were talking about electric vehicles and how to how do we accelerate the electric vehicle transition. But uh, there are in a lot of places are looking at how do you use electric vehicles to you know aggregate together to make a super battery to allow fluctuations and balancing fluctuations on and off the grid. And as we do that, there are there's tremendous potential in there. But as we add technology, we also have need to consider the risk part of the reward equation. Um, and that's what this panel um, is going to be talking about. And I'm very pleased that we have a, an expert group assembled um, to look at the cybersecurity of our grid as we transition um, transition towards a cleaner, uh, more renewable, more equitable, more just future. So I'm going to do a brief introduction of each of the panelists, and then I will turn it over to them, um, and I will come back at the end and, and moderate the questions. So we're going to begin with Andy Bachman, who is a senior grid strategist for Idaho National Laboratories National and Homeland Security Directorate, um, where he focuses on the intersection between grid security and resilience. Um, really interesting work around standards development that we think about all of the people participating all the groups and utilities participating in the energy system some of the standards that they need to meet to ensure that they are providing reliable safe systems and he's also working on a book i've read so uh, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that as well following andy will be rick morose who is a managing director at resolute strategies llc as well as a senior director at archer Public Affairs, um, where I know Rick from and, and best from is his role as Senior Advisor to Protect Our Power, which is a national non-industry, non-profit um, advocacy organization focusing on best practices and investments in cybersecurity. And his experience is, is lengthy as he served as the past president of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, as well as the past chair of NARUC's Critical Infrastructure Committee. Following Rick will be Sarah Hoffman, who since 2015 has served as commissioner on the Vermont Public Utility Commission. Um, she also serves in multiple leadership positions with NARUC, focusing on nuclear issues, telecommunications, um, and energy as well. She also has a very lengthy experience working on issues in New England in a variety of different roles, um, but really focusing on what, what states are doing. And we'll be hearing about more from her about that and bringing up in our final panelist is Dr. Rajdeep Gad, who is a professor at the Henry Samuel School of Engineering and Applied Science at UCLA, the founding director of the UCLA Smart Grid Energy Research Center, and the founder and director of the Wireless Internet for Mobile Enterprise Consortium, um, where he's spent his career focusing on electric vehicles, smart grids, microgrids, um, and really knitting together many of the elements of the energy transition uh, that we've heard about today and we'll be hearing about in in this panel specifically. So very excited to, to hear everyone's presentations. Um, we will be taking questions at the end. So if you will submit them, our moderators are, are sorry, Antonio and uh, Austin are gathering those questions and we'll be, we've reserved time at the end uh, to provide some answers. So. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Andy, um, who will begin our presentations. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thanks to all attendees taking your time hanging in there for this last session on security. Uh, my fellow panelists, the bio sounds sure sound impressive, but let's see if let's see if I can share a screen. Let's see if we can get the presentation up. That will be truly impressive if we can make that happen. All right, let's see.
All right. Well, it looks to me like I'm sharing the screen. If uh, someone thinks otherwise, uh, please, uh, please let me know. All right, so I'm, uh, there's only a handful of slides here on my presentation. I do not want to suck the oxygen out of out of the the room, so to speak, the virtual room. This is just for a little bit of orientation about uh, where I'm coming from as we get later on into the Q and A's. So, yeah, you'll see that uh, I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from and just give you a couple quick points. Uh, some of you may or may not have had much exposure to the Department of Energy's National Lab Complex. There are 17 of them, probably the closest one to uh, you folks in New England and New Jersey is Brookhaven on Long Island. Uh, the one that I'm affiliated with, even though I'm not there, uh, is uh, Idaho National Lab in Southeast Idaho, Idaho Falls. And these guys have made 52 different nuclear test reactors over their uh, multiple decades. And out of that experience has uh, emerged some very relevant uh, capabilities, some some very relevant capabilities for our talk today, um, mainly dealing with the cyber physical aspects, not just IT cyber, uh, but operational cyber, industrial control system uh, is another word for it, SCADA, et cetera. So just, you know, these are, these are my uh, expert colleagues, what they're uh, doing day-to-day -day basis, although many of them are working virtually uh, as I am too, and as I'm sure many of you on the line are as well. Uh, my background includes those different logos. That's where I've worked, uh, not including some of the startups I've worked at, uh, some of the papers that uh, I've written that inform this talk, uh, all of which are searchable. And if you can't reach them, my contact information will be at the end and I'll be happy to send you things. The book that Mark mentioned is gonna come out in January, 2021. And uh, it's uh, an introduction to this methodology that was founded at the Idaho National Lab called Consequence Driven Cyber Informed Engineering. The idea being, uh, as I'll mention, I think on a, on a next slide, that in some cases there are ways to prevent the absolute worst things from happening in critical infrastructure that don't rely on adding more cyber technology to something, but actually turning to proven first principles engineering to take the targets completely off the table when we simply can't accept uh, the amount of risk on uh, that currently we're enduring on some very critical uh, functions in critical infrastructure sectors. So my colleagues, again, um, many of them have experience on uh, both sides of the battle, the offensive and defensive side, and that has led them to these three points. And one is that uh, what we're doing, what everybody's doing today, and it, we'll call this cyber hygiene, best practices, compliance, et cetera. It's certainly necessary to keep uh, all manner of adversaries and malware at bay, uh, but it is not sufficient to protect the things that matter most that are being targeted the most. Uh, second point is that if a certain adversary is aiming at your systems, uh, they will succeed. They will be able to get in past network defenses and take up residence and networks and systems and, and look around and plan to do some things that aren't, aren't necessarily good. So they will have success. Uh, I'm not gonna go in deep on that methodology here. I'm not gonna go in deep on anything. This is what I want to mainly spend time on, uh, but we can talk about those things later on or in uh, future conversations if you have an interest. There's two points here, there's two, two topics here, right? One is uh, in Huffington Post, a million years ago, or actually just 10 years ago, but it feels that way. Uh, I made a case that if you wanted to really build out smart grid technologies and uh, achieve the benefits from them, that, you know, so I'm talking about more DER and AMI and smart meters and things like that, you had to make sure that you were doing this in, in a secure way, using products that were capable of, of being secured configuration wise. If we didn't do that, this, this case says uh, that ultimately we would see that they were so unreliable, so uh, easy for uh, attackers to, to uh, infiltrate and cause trouble and you know, basically hurt your city, hurt your town, that uh, we wouldn't have the confidence to deploy them. So again, that's searchable. I just went and checked to make sure I could find it again and the URL was just below it. I think it's, uh, it's pretty good for making an argument for somebody that might be a little bit 
uh, unsure about the need for security in some of these in some of these scenarios. And the second uh, example on the right hand side from now from just five years ago was uh, my boss at the time, Brent Stacy at Idaho National Lab, was asked in D.C. in a uh, Senate hearing, um, would he be surprised if uh, a city in the U.S. was blacked out by cyber means tomorrow? And uh, Brent said no. And the other three panelists, one from a utility, one from EPRI, and one from the General Accountability Office, they all said, yeah, they'd be totally surprised. Ultimately, when I talked to Brent about it afterwards, we decided the best answer would be yes, but not very, meaning yes, because it hadn't happened before. So, of course, it's a surprise, but not very based on the rationale, the three points in the rationale below. One is that distribution level voltages and feeds are what go into cities and towns and that the those are not covered that equipment and the utilities that provide them uh, don't have to meet the stringent requirements of the NERC SIPs which are applied to higher voltage transmission lines distributions um, uh, substations control centers etc secondly was because the distribution uh, that level, again, is where so much of the smart grid activity was happening with products from new suppliers that never really had to think about security very much. And um, I, st I keep seeing this typo in, uh, when I pull the slide in. It looks like it's French, but it's really supposed to say less cyber oversight uh, per my previous point in the NERC SIPs. So enough of that. Uh, one of our mantras that we express in addition to those, those three points I made earlier is uh, think like a hacker. Imagine what the bad person is going to try to do to your systems, to your town, uh, to your sector that you work in, but act like an engineer. Somebody who solves problems, and figure out ways, and we can help you with that uh, to help that uh, to help having the very bad things from happen to you. Uh, we've been doing it with people uh, recently. If you want to get more up to speed, there's a variety of training that's available. Some for free, uh, some. Uh, for, for cost, but all of these things uh, could help you or colleagues that you have in mind uh, get more up to speed on the types of OC, OT security or ICS security that are relevant uh, when we're talking about modernizing, modernizing the grid and building defenses uh, for it. This is uh, me saying goodbye. You see my email and my Twitter handle, and that's the Milwaukee waterfront uh, where I moved two years ago from Boston. Thanks a lot. That's it. Thank you, Andy. Um, if anyone has any Andy's presentation, it can and pose them on the various forum formats or form forums that the the uh, panel is being broadcast on, and we will collect those. Um, and now we'll turn it over to Rick, um, who will begin to discuss some of the regulatory issues around cybersecurity protection. Great, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. And it's great to be with everybody and some very familiar faces, including Mark, who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, in this collaboration that he mentioned, which I will speak about for a few moments. Some of you may very well know the work that was done between Protect Our Power and Vermont Law School, which has been uh, really insightful to regulators and to the industry. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about the product uh, of the research and work. Uh, I'll also uh, give some thoughts about where we are going in the future as an organization and addressing some of these regulatory issues to help advance cybersecurity protections in the energy and utility sectors. And uh, last, just make some observations about what the continuing and evolving threat is and issues that in this uh, evolving, uh, smarter grid that we are all facing and that you were talking about more particularly earlier today, what those continued vulnerabilities are that need to be addressed from a, the industry standpoint and from the regulator standpoint, and most particularly from the perspective of how to pay for the investments to continue to protect the grid. Um, as Mark said, I'm senior advisor to Protect Our Power, a nonprofit, non-industry funded advocacy organization, which was founded about four years ago. And I joined as a senior advisor to continue much of the work that 
I was doing as an advocate for cybersecurity protection as the president of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities and chairman of NARUG's Critical Infrastructure Committee. Next slide, please. Uh, the organization has uh, been undertaking uh, a series of efforts simply to be an advocate um, uh, to on uh, uh, Capitol Hill with regulators in Washington at the FERC, uh, with policymakers and with uh, um, with uh, the state regulators and policymakers. We have an educational institution, a 501c3 and a c4 for that advocacy, and we've assembled a group of advisors from various industry subsectors. Uh, and we have been undertaking a series of specific uh, programmatic activities. The first is to identify best practices in the ITOT convergence world and a university partnership to uh, do uh, peer evaluations of those solutions from the vendor community. We're also uh, trying to identify the um, uh, issues that are most important to trying to identify regulatory hurdles for the implementation of protective measures and uh, the cost recovery issues as well. And that leads us to the work that we did with Vermont Law School and that we're continuing to do now on supply chain, which I'll talk more particularly about in just a moment. Next slide, please. So th two and a half years ago, uh, the organization began a partnership with Vermont Law and uh, to, to look at a series of issues and survey the landscape in the states on what were the issues associated with uh, the hurdles or case studies for the success of advancing uh, the, the uh, regulatory uh, paradigm for uh, cybersecurity protection in the states. Now, I was fortunate as the president of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities to have been the chair of a commission, one of the first in the country. In fact, we believe it was the first in the country to issue a cybersecurity specific board order uh, addressing these issues and working with the industry in our state. Uh, and also confronting the cost recovery issues that were uh, associated with that. So the purpose of the research that we did with Vermont Law School was, as you see here, to identify pathways uh, for model approaches to uh, for commissions to deal with these issues, to assess the opportunities, both at the commission level, but also on pub the public policy level, including statutory issues to help secure the grid. Also to suggest streamlined approaches in the states to provide those incentives, the financial incentives necessary to make these investments. And then to try to um, encourage uh, commissions throughout the country to take some, some uniform perspectives on addressing these issues. And the reason for that is uh, those of you that follow it know that even because of the uh, dichotomy between the federal uh, government uh, regulating the bulk power system and the states regulating the distribution systems, there is been a, there has been adopted at the federal level NERC SIP standards, but in the states there is no specific standard for cybersecurity to be embraced by the industry. And one of the sort of building blocks from the get go was that we encourage the commissions in every state to identify the benchmark, the framework by which they will judge cybersecurity compliance in the industry in their state. Next slide, please. With Vermont Law School, with Mark being the lead uh, researcher, by the way, um, we undertook two separate phases of research. Mark and his team and uh, those the Vermont Law School team went out and did surveys of various activities in the states. And uh, this was a, the these are the core issues that were identified in the first phase report, which were issues around or hurdles to protecting the confidential information, the potential threat issues that the industry was concerned might, if they were to be disclosed, could be a hurdle to the commissions actually dealing with the uh, issues they needed to or to even uh, provide for cost recovery. The second was uh, looking at the diversity of the utility systems across the country and whether there were gaps in under-resourced uh, uh, electric uh, companies. And 
one of the findings was particularly that the disparity between the IOUs, co-ops, and public power uh, distribution companies was actually significant. And uh, to our surprise, one of the things that was identified most particularly was a focus need to be turned to those underserved, under-resourced, smaller electric systems than, say, the uh, investor-owned companies. Another area that the first phase identified is for uh, potential attention and as hurdles regard, were regarding cost recovery. And this is an ongoing struggle that commissions have throughout the country is how to or what metrics to use to identify uh, how those cost recovery mechanisms can work for these the, the, the enhanced investments that need to be made. And related to all that are, is, the, ident is the, the fact that there are no good clear metrics to identify the costs and the benefits to these enhanced measures, these enhanced investments that bring about cybersecurity protection or other resilience investments, which we talk about more and more going beyond simply the reliability of service, but to resilience, the, whether it's the redundancy ne necessary or additional protections. So the first phase of first report issued by Vermont Law School a year and a almost a year and a half ago now, identified these issues as hurdles to cybersecurity advancement. Next slide. The second phase, Mark and his team did a really good job of identifying case studies in various states that were success stories on how to address those areas identified in the first phase, the protection of confidential information and how that could be done and model suggestions on either regulation or statutory provisions that could be implemented in the states to help protect the information so that the industry could be comfortable in making the filings and putting forth that information to the commissions in their deliberations. The next was identifying reports and audits that could be a tool for the commissions to help identify areas where investments needed to be made and thus a foundation for the industry to come back to the to, to commissions and ask for those investments to be made as a response to the reports or audits that the commissions undertake on a routine basis. Another area was around the metrics that are now being used in various states to specifically identify the benefit to the investments that are made, the measures that are, are Im implemented, and the relative cost of how those cost could then be recovered. And Mark and his team identified a number of states where cost recovery was accomplished by the industry successfully uh, and, and various methodologies or rate structures that could be identified in some states for a, as a tool for the commissions to help support these investments. And the last was generally uh, an area and focus around grid modernization with grid modernization dockets throughout the country at various commissions, whether they be comprehensive grid modernization dockets or dockets around, for instance, uh, AMI, or even around electric vehicles, some of the commissions used that docket or that platform then to address the specific cybersecurity needs of the electric distribution companies, thereby giving them the foundation to enter into these discussions. But the that points out and it comes back to the issues that you have been talking about earlier today, that we are confronted particularly in the states, but throughout the electric system, that as we have this more highly digitized system um, with, by the way, uh, um, estimates of uh, in, um, uh, devices to be bolted onto the electric system, uh, expanding every day, whether it be at the bulk power system or down to the distribution system, with IoT devices estimated to be worldwide in the 75 billion range by 2025, uh, you can see that the, that the landscape, the platform for potential threats, for hacks, for intrusions into the system is only expanding exponentially. And that is the issue. That is the the, the, the threat that needs to be confronted. Next slide. So Protect Our Power continues its work as an advocate 
in the states to support, um, as Vermont Law School uh, identified, pathways for the ways to uh, for action to address uh, cybersecurity threats. Uh, the, re the report gave um, measures that commissions could take and industry could take as instructive, all of which has been helpful. And I should say that we just recently provided a, uh, a, a presentation to ne Nehruk, and I um, commented that the work that was done over the last 18 months to two years with Vermont Law School still stands the test of time. The recommendations, those pathways identified, are still measures that I and we, and I know our uh, uh, commissions around the country are identifying as methods and frameworks that they can employ to meet these cybersecurity challenges. Next slide. So let me just make some final comments about what we're doing and some threats that are looming and that we too at Protect Our Power are trying to continue to turn focus upon. We've established, as I said, ourselves as a credible voice in these issues and continue to work with state commissions and with NARUC and other organizations such as NASIO and the National Governors Association. We continue to work with Vermont Law School and we'll look forward to other partnerships or collaborations on particular projects. As I said, we've also been working on best practices around identifying measures the vendor community can bring to the electric system for ITOT measures. And we are, as I said, working with the states, but one area in particular, because of the nature of this increasingly digitized electronic system that is being built with our new smart grid, we are turning focus to the supply chain issues. Uh, we're working with Governor Tom Ridge, uh, former, sec former Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, he has a, had identified from the time he was at Homeland Security and thereafter when he left, the vulnerabilities around supply chain. We've done several research projects with Governor Ridge now to identify issues around vulnerabilities in the supply chain and how to address them. We have issued a report with Governor Ridge uh, a year ago on smart inverters and the potential threats to them, particularly in the PV solar area, uh, and identified some real threats and how to address them. And then we followed up with a report with Governor Ridge and Ridge Global to look more comprehensively at suggestions around how to manage the frameworks around supply chain, supply chain uh, assembly, manufacture, and the introduction of them into the electric system. That report was issued last year. And we are now working with Governor Ridge in a series of discussions with industry and the vendor community to help and be hopefully a voice to inform the rulemaking process that's occurring at the Department of Energy currently around uh, supply chain, supply chain risks, and what will be a rulemaking that the department is undertaking under an executive order issued last year. So we continue to, as an organization, uh, try to provide best practices in the regulatory area and give advice to the community of regulators, of policymakers and to the industry about how to confront these cybersecurity vulnerabilities of this increasingly digitized smart grid that we know we'll have and we'll have to make sure that it's protected. So it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. And as always, it's great to be back with everybody at Vermont Law School. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rick. Um, just on a note, if anyone is looking for any of the resources that Rick had mentioned, you can find them on the Protect Our Power website, um, which is protectourpower.org, or with the Vermont Law School um, reports that I worked on. Um, if you go to Institute for Energy's website, which is law.edu slash energy, you'll find uh, our two cybersecurity reports there. Um, there's a lot of information on the Protect Our Power website, and I recommend that people check that out to see what issues are being worked on before we know that they are they have become an issue. Um, so with that, I will turn to um, Sarah Hoffman um, and ask her to, to do her presentation. Sarah? Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate being here. Um, and uh, the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law does a lot of wonderful work that I'm quite familiar with. Um, I'll give the usual disclaimer up front. Remarks are my own and don't reflect the views of my commission or fellow commissioners. 
I uh, like to say that any stupid thing I might utter is mine and mine alone. <coughs> I want to talk about cybersecurity, <coughs> excuse me, from a public commissioner perspective. As regulators, we have a unique role in cybersecurity. We want to make sure our grid is protected, but we also may want to make sure that the money spent <coughs> on cyber measures is both effective and prudent because it is consumers who reap the benefits, but they're also on the ones that pay the bill. I hope to address both these issues and the challenges we all face. From the commissioner perspective, cybersecurity is an incredibly serious matter. Our society runs on electricity. Um, loss of electricity, of course, means uh, loss of revenues to businesses across the board. And after three days without power, societal norms start to break down. The regulators need to make sure our utilities are doing everything reasonable to prevent incidents and also to be ready and able to recover quickly when there is an incursion, because I'm going to go back to what Andy said earlier, there will be successes. Um, it's just a, just a given. We cannot protect against everything. So much of what public utilities do is regulating our utilities in almost a court-like role. But I believe that in the cyber area, we need to act somewhat differently. Yes, we have adjudicatory, adjudicatory functions, but we must partner with the utilities as well because it's by working together that we mitigate these unique cyber threats. Um, you know, the utilities know their system best and they also have cyber experts working for them, at least we hope they do. Um, and so it really is the teaming up that's gonna make the difference because a, a big challenge is we are not cybersecurity experts like Andy Bachman is. This kind of collaboration means talking with utilities regularly and encouraging them to talk to each other because our systems are interconnected. Uh, from the smallest solar project to the biggest generator, and our small utilities are under attack just like our larger ones. But large or small, each has responsibilities and each has areas of weakness. But we do encourage people to talk with each other because sometimes the larger ones can provide resources to some of our smaller munis. Additionally, the PUCs also have to stay up to speed on cyber themselves. That means regular training, exercise. You don't want to open a window to the, to the grid through something so small as like a solar installation. The Vermont Public Utility Commission is always reviewing projects and what else we can do to make sure that there is good uh, cyber health it, it, from our perspective. There are many challenges uh, in working in cybersecurity. One of them is that small cracks can lead to big problems. And so detection mechanisms are crucial and sharing anomalies with each other among our utilities is equally important. An additional challenge is that the, land, is that the landscape is always changing. Uh, for a while, it seemed like I was hearing a lot about nation state actors and what they were doing. Then it was kind of organized crime and use of ransomware. And tomorrow it might be some other actor. So we have to ask our utilities to be nimble, looking for an organized crime attack. The local, the lonely hacker in the basement or quite simply an employee that likes to open attachments without thinking about it. Being ready for everything can be daunting and exhausting, but by use of protocols, communication, best practices, use of analytics and diligence, our utilities are trying to protect the grid from the unknown attacks yet, yet to be seen. But we want to see each of those steps in there, best practices, communication, use of analytics, that kind of thing. A third challenge I see is in resources, both human and dollars. Shiny sub cybersecurity hardware is, is lovely and necessary, but you do need the human resources to keep it functioning well. My understanding is that top quality cybersecurity people are in high demand. That means we see, may see more dollars used to attract good people or use of consultants, but that 
all requires uh, judgment calls by the utilities and also judgment calls by the economic regula regulators. So what does all this mean for the economic regulators examining the utility expenditures? Utilities, understandably, want to be told, here's what we want specifically. And if they do that, they will have guaranteed recovery. But this compliance-based approach doesn't work for cyber because checklists don't work because of the evolving nature of cybersecurity issues. Utilities have to be nimble, and frankly, that means the regulators also have to be nimble. We need to think about broadly about cybersecurity and how to determine what, whether the utility is doing an adequate job and what are prudent expenses. We also have to acknowledge from the PUC, PUC perspective what I said earlier, that we are not cybersecurity experts. Um, and we want to be very careful about what kind of information is disclosed when we're talking about our utility cybersecurity measures. You don't want to disclose things that are not um, that you don't want other people to know about. We have to come up with ways to measure our utilities' progress and expenses on cybersecurity, given those limitations. There has to be a balance of the threat versus the dollar spent, and you know how you do that is is really what uh, Rick is talking about. That he worked with the law school to come up with some some uh, various metrics and some ways to look at the regulatory framework, including cost review and recovery. Um, you know, this is really important. I can't stress how much as a PUC commissioner, I appreciate work like this being done because this is a difficult area. I will mention that recently the USAID uh, in conjunction with the National Association of Public Utility Commissioners recently published a guide that used uh, cybersecurity maturity models that look very interesting. Thus far, there's no one approach across the country, and I think PUCs are looking for ways to help them make evaluations in the cyber area. Now, to the very practical side of what the New England commissions are doing. The New England Conference of Public Utility Commissioners, that's the six New England Public Utility Commissions, has organized the New England Utility Cybersecurity Integration Collaborative shorthanded as New Kick, great name, to collaborate among the region's utilities and agencies to address cybersecurity issues. New Kick provides utilities and other authorized stakeholders with access to tools to address cybersecurity issues and concerns and promotes collaboration with the federal and state partners, including the six New England Utility Commissions, the Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy, and the New Hampshire National Guard. Regional partners are owners and operators of critical infrastructure in New England, including Eversource Energy and ISO New England, the region's electric grid operator. We envision other New England utilities to partner with us as we get uh, more and more experience in this area. I'll finish with a safety minute because it is Cybersecurity Month. Nobody's mentioned that. When I was talking to my Vermont utilities about uh, this presentation, I asked them what would be one thing they would want a group to know uh, that would be good for any group, regardless of skill level. And my favorite answer was never click on any attachment. Now, obviously, that isn't possible in today's world, but at least for this cyber safety uh, minute, Please think twice before clicking and saying, oh, what's this? Anyway, thank you for having me and look forward to questions. Thank you, Sarah. That was an excellent, very quick um, review of something that's very complicated. Obviously, you've been working on for, for a long time with a lot of a lot of questions. Uh, that, that it, so it's great to hear about that. Um, we're now going to turn to our final panelist, um, uh, Professor Gotti. Are you ready to go? Yes, I'm going to try and share my screen, if that's okay. Um, let's see. Uh, can you see a PowerPoint presentation with a lot of photographs? Yet. Uh, can Can you see my Can you see a PowerPoint presentation? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. All right. 
Let's see, try again here. Are you able to see a PowerPoint presentation? Yes, we are. Hello? Okay, great, great. Okay, just send it. Okay, I'm gonna make it. All right. So I'm gonna talk about cybersecurity with specific context to smart electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Before I talk, I just want to say, Andy, you wanted me to think like a hacker. So I've been trying to do that for the last 30 minutes. Uh, Rick, you talked about the smart grid and 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 you know digital technologies, and and I'm going to refer to that, and uh, in, in terms of you know what are the security sort of threats there, and the smart grid is creating a lot of those. And finally, I think Sarah, you mentioned something interesting. You said systems are interconnected, and what that means is that any anybody sitting anywhere in North America that gets into some electric car charging uh, electric car through the charging station into the distribution system, and so. Yes, in the worst case, there are, there's a lot of very complicated uh, uh, scenarios when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just first give you a sort of a broad overview of uh, the UCLA program, uh, the Smart Grid program that I started over a decade ago. Uh, the UCLA Smart Grid program is also part of the UCLA Grand Challenge. So there's a very nice video with uh, President Obama, and some of the professors in UCLA. Uh, just a quick plug for UCLA there. UCLA has been working in this area for well over a decade. Um, and our program got launched by way of a, a grant from the U.S. Department of Energy uh, under Secretary Stephen Chu uh, to the Smart Grid Demonstration Program to work with the City of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, Department of Water and Power uh, serves roughly 5 million customers. Uh, it's a roughly 5 to 6 uh, 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 gigawatt electric utility. That's about 10% of the load of California peak load. And we, we essentially uh, got funded over a decade ago to be able to demonstrate uh, smart grid technologies in UCLA and USC. And so I was running the UCLA program. And the result of that was essentially the genesis of a microgrid in the UCLA campus. So here you see the UCLA campus. Uh, we converted that into an, an engineering uh, uh, sort of a working lab, if you will. So we have a cogen plant in at UCLA. And that means we can generate three quarters of the energy that we want, and we buy a quarter from the electric utility. And then that feeds the rest of the, the campus grid, which is about a you know, 60 uh, megawatt grid, right? So the traditional flow of information uh, on the grid before smart grid, if you will, was one way where the grid operator tells you what to do. The power flow was one way and control flow was one way. Now what's going on is, you have down on the customer premises behind the meter, you've got, uh, in addition to things like smart meters and so forth, you've got, your, you've got your electric vehicles, you've got solar panels, you've got batteries. So these are three new DERs, as they're known as distributed energy resources, that are local generation, storage, and consumption. And in fact, with electric vehicles, you could store energy in the battery and make it available later on in the day. So it, it, essentially, it has turned this whole notion of the grid on its head because now all of a sudden the customer UCLA can be a producer and sell, send, send power back to the grid. That means that the flow of information, power and control in the new grid you see is bi-directional. The red arrows, black arrows and blue arrows are all bi-directional. In UCLA we installed, as part of the grant, we installed solar panels, batteries and about uh, 150 EV charging stations. We registered 500 uh, drivers uh, into our program and we started this research. And, and when we started this research about a decade ago, we encountered something called the California Solar Duck Curve. And that was that and this was from California ISO. And then the prediction, the projection was that by the year 2020, what would happen is in the middle of the day, you'd have so much solar generation that the grid demand would fall and then it would rise. There'd be a steep ramp up and there'll be an evening peak. California already has a bad evening peak. So the question is, how do you prevent? So of course, this is 2012 and this is 2020. And of course, you know, and as you go move forward, what's going to happen is at some point the demand will turn zero, frankly negative. And now what do you do? Well, guess what happened in California? It's been happening for the last two three years. We've been selling power to Arizona at negative pricing. So those are the kinds of problems that we are solving with our engineering research. So the innovations that came out was in the workplace, you know. And so one of the issues is how do you, for example, how does UCLA serve? Uh, you know, 1,000 EV drivers at, let's say, 10 kilowatt per driver, that's adding 10 megawatts to the load when our peak load is, you know, 60 megawatts or 50 megawatts on most days. Now, 
And, and that means that you want to use your capacity. You want to use your kilowatt capacity to serve more cars. So one thing we did was on a single circuit, you can serve four cars because each car needs 40 miles a day and you can drive. Uh, essentially, you can control everything with software. Now you're serving four cars with a single outlet. Now, we have this massive control center. Why is it important? It's important because you're gathering data from sensors, right? From a security standpoint, somebody can hack into the sensor. Somebody can hack into the communications device. Somebody can hack into electric car, charging station. Somebody can hack into the cloud. So it turns out that there is a greater amount of, as you as as the grid expands in the on the distribution and the customer premises side, there is more and more and more devices. And that's really what's going to happen. So it shows you the huge network that we had to put together 150 chargers in UCL and another 100 outside the campus. And it, this even shows you the UCLA, our research center had uh, uh, charging stations in six different locations, all the way up to Pomona, down to the down to the port of LA. Now I'm going to talk about one specific research project that that will show you some of the challenges. For example, in parking structure number nine, the, in the microgrid, we actually had uh, this PhD student incentivize drivers to be able to charge when the sun is shining. So we gave them an app and here you see the solar generation on a particular day. And then we said, either you charge when the sun is shining or you let us charge. Why? Because if we can consume solar energy locally, we can help solve the solar duck problem. So they, we built this whole system out and the student ran, we are engineers, right? Uh, so we built this out and we realized that if you incentivize people the right way, you can achieve uh, increased utilization of energy, solar energy locally, and so we created a notion of a smart coin. It's a virtual currency that allows people to, to, to buy and trade energy using this interesting concept. So that we're thinking about how do we take that smart coin and, and create a transactive grid in the future. But here's another interesting slide. This is about, uh, this is essentially our microgrid slide. And so what this is, it shows you the sun, sh it was shining and then slowly in the evening hours, the sun sort of uh, faded away. And here you see, in the evening when you're shortage of power, we sent a demand response signal to this uh, bunch of electric cars and you shut the load down. Well, demand response signals are originating from the electric utility and they come to our campus grid. And guess what? What if somebody hacks into it? What if somebody says, hey, um, I'm, I, I want you to shut down everything, right? Or, or, or what if I want to do negative demand response? So please up your load. So remember, DR can be up or down. So those are potential challenges on the grid. Now, here's another interesting example. Uh, Yubo, Dr. Yubo Wang now, he, his PhD was on discharging a car into the grid. That means your car becomes a DR asset. So this is what Mitsubishi, uh, I may have this like, this slide is from eight, nine years ago. And uh, so we built, I, I tell people, we built some of the first e uh, vehicle to grid systems west, west of the Rockies. And uh, here you see the state of charge of a vehicle, which is constant, and then it goes down. Well, it goes down because if the price of electricity is high, we sell power to the grid. We make money. When the price is low, we buy power. And so the state of charge at the end of the day can vary. But at, of course, what you can do is you can say there's a certain threshold below which I don't want to go. Why am I showing this again? V2G systems can also be a potential security hazard. This is a high power V2G system we built for Santa Monica. Here's another very interesting research project, engineering project. This is for the UCLA fleet. 42 electric charging stations were installed. And you see the fleet return, the fleet vehicles are plugging in and, and, and there's a massive peak in the evening, exacerbating our, our evening peak. Well, and then we had AI algorithms to be able to actually optimize the charging so that you're cutting down the peak. Well, these algorithms are sitting on the cloud. What if somebody hacks into them, right? Or what if somebody said, mm -mm -mm, all the vehicles should be charging at 6 p.m. and make the peak even worse. So cybersecurity is not is, is, a, is a threat for on the cyber side or the physical side, okay? So somebody can hack into the virtual or and hit the physical. Here's another interesting project we have on um, bus charging. And this is uh, with LADWP. We just finished it. And we optimize. And so this whole thing is essentially all about creating infrastructure for buses and trucks, which is a big area of research for me. How do you optimize the, the, the charging so that you don't rely too much on the grid by having smart sensors, smart actuators, take a lot of data, do the AI, and actually figure out when to charge again? Notice more data, more communications, uh, more systems, more digital technologies, and therefore more uh, um, greater challenge for cybersecurity. And this just shows you the control center we built for that project, which just takes all the data. Now I'm going to jump into a cybersecurity project we have. We are, are funded. We are part of a, a, a center with four UC, with three UC, UC campuses, and we look at what are what is the attack vector. Attack vector means, for example, you can attack the Zigbee network or the gateways, routers, Wi-Fi, etc. And so 
the issue about attacking is there's a cost to the attack and the impact. So it's it's not just you know what if somebody attacks and, and, and you know steals a, a guava from my front yard. I have a guava tree by the way. So it's fine. You know that's that's not not so big deal. But the impact of the attack is very important. So the ratio, the impact to the cost, right? So that's what is important because it's, it, and so if, if if the cost is low and the impact is high, that's really kind of the, the bad situation. Right? That's called the risk. So what we did was for each of the attack vectors, we actually ranked uh, the the impact, the cost, and the risk, and we find that interestingly enough, malware discharging of EV to the grid poses the highest risk. Okay, why? Because if all the cars suddenly discharge into the grid, the grid can come down because there'll be voltage problems, frequency problems, things like that. So that's part of that research project we have. The other thing, which I do mind to mention, Sarah, you talked very interestingly about what happens on the grid and, and correlations and things like that, anomalies, right? So anomalies is something we actually look at anomalies in the EV charging network. And, and literally you can look at anomalies between pricing and the solar generation or how people are charging EVs versus building loads. And you, it's interesting, once you get into that with AI algorithms, you find very, very interesting correlations, some non-correlations, but that is one of the approaches we are using is anomalies in our EV charging network and use to actually determine what, what are the potential uh, cybersecurity risks. And we actually have our students ha hacking and attacking our own infrastructure, which is sort of interesting. In any case, with that, I'm gonna stop in the interest of time. And of course, uh, back to our, our, our panel, panel chair. Thank Professor you, Professor. James, Thank, yes. Thank you, Professor Gandhi. That was incredible to see what the work that you've done over the past a decade in pulling together, um, building a system and then thinking about the risks um, that the system itself creates. Um, so we're going to, we have some questions that they've collected from uh, the viewers. I have some questions of my own. So I'm going to start, of course, with uh, the moderator's prerogative and ask a question of my own. One of the, the technology terms that I've heard a, a couple of you use was a discussion of IT versus OT. Um, wondering if, if someone can pick up on that and expand how cybersecurity creates some unique challenges for how uh, utilities have historically operated. Uh, I'm not sure who, who would want to. If Andy's got his hand raised, will Andy take that question? I'll give it a, I'll give it a, a start and see uh, if, if I uh, set it up for someone else to bring it all the way home. Um, this comes from experience going up on Capitol Hill and talking to senators, Congress folks and uh, staffers and trying to explain some of these semi or more technical terms to them, in words they can understand. So I'll try to do the same here. Um, IT is things that I think almost everybody uh, in all walks of life is now familiar with. We have to use it in order to be able to have this session today. It's your laptop, it's your phone, it's the Wi-Fi in your house or at your company, it's databases and applications, and uh, ideally it's privacy as well and security. Um, when something happens, when something is hacked, when someone does something and uses a system in a way it wasn't intended uh, by the owner or operator, uh, in the IT world, uh, nobody dies. Nobody gets hurt physically. They may be hurt in other ways, financially, for example. Um, in the OT world, operational technology, we're talking about computers and networked computers that control physical processes. Imagine a manufacturing plant, a chemical plant, uh, an electric utility that makes electricity by burning coil, converting it converting it into steam, which drives turbines, and ultimately through a motor creates electricity, which then shoots out through the substation and across wires. All of those different things that the electric utility does involves a significant chance for human harm, uh, not just to the folks that work at the utility, although certainly them, uh, and that's why their safety cultures are so rich. But, uh, you know, electricity makes elevators go up and down Electricity makes things happen at hospitals and uh, on construction sites and everywhere. So it's the kinetic aspect of the cybersecurity world and everything becoming a computer uh, that what we mean when we say OT, industrial control systems, SCADA, cyber physical.
Thank you. I'm not sure anyone else want to add on to Yeah, and I'll just that. jump in, um, if you don't mind, Mark, uh, to um, not necessarily address the question directly, but to build on what Andy just said, the description of that convergence of the technologies, the importance of it. The importance most particularly is to protect in the electric system, those control systems uh, to make sure that uh, they are uh, not in, uh, hacked, not encrypted, not not um, uh, vulnerable to an attack, to a shutdown. Uh, there are other ty types of vulnerabilities which could cause uh, voltage overloads and the like. I'm not the technical person. Rajit might be able to talk a little bit more about that, but what I've been concerned about throughout my career and as a form regulator, you now former regulator and the work we're doing now is to try to bring focus to the, the, the whole spectrum and plethora of uh, solutions that are out there to try and protect uh, or address those vulnerabilities around the convergence of IT and OT. And the one issue that we have ended up identifying it protect our power is that there are numerous and multiples of solutions and vendors providing options or, or solutions. And one of the concerns right now is that the, the, the senior folks at uh, electric or utility companies, the CISOs, the, the IT folks, the, 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 the physical facility security people, all the way up to the C-suite are overwhelmed with solutions. And what we've tried to do is bring focus to the fact that the industry should really be looking at best practices in those protective measures. What are the best solutions that are out there rather than fielding uh, cold calls from hundreds of vendors that are literally out there offering solutions? And it's really incumbent upon the industry, policymakers, regulators, and um, uh, lawyers that are doing this kind of work. Uh, to help try to help the industry identify what those best practices are to, to so that the companies can better protect themselves. Thank you. On from your answer, Rick, I'm going to pick up on a question we received from from the audience, and it's fairly short, but I think it's a a question that's going to require a little more to answer. It's what makes the supply chain so dangerous? You had talked about that there are hundreds of vendors. Um, thousands of different products. Um, when we we conceptualized, we, we saw with Professor Gotti when he's talking, just putting together a system. Um, what is it in that supply chain that can create vulnerabilities that might be exploited? Yeah, I'll make a general comment and then I'll just tell a short story about that. The the vulnerabilities are the components, whether they can be encrypted. Um, and what the vulnerabilities are with regard to their operation, their, their abilities to communicate. Um, uh, Rajit mentioned that you know, the, this new grid um, is not one that was designed that way with two-way power flow and the communications that are necessary to make sure that that grid can and will be stable with all of these new devices that are integrated into it. I mentioned earlier the work we did with Governor Tom Ridge on smart inverters um, in the in the PV industry. Um, we, uh, through our work uh, on the peer review of, uh, of of supply chain, had the opportunity with uh, one of our colleagues at uh, Washington State University, one of their lead researchers on one of our projects, who said to us, you know, the the issue you pointed out in uh, uh, the, the, the first Ridge Global Protect Our Power report on smart inverters was real. Uh, this researcher told me that they had a smart inverter in their lab, um, said that it does, when you power it up, it does the ET thing. I said, what's that? Uh, he said, it calls home. The first thing that the smart inverter did was not to uh, check its own systems to check it integrity. It was calling the central server of the company that manufactured it, which happened to be in another country, by the way. Uh, that's the vulnerability. Uh, so whether it's the ability to communicate and the potential for an intrusion into it or the integrity of the components themselves, which could be manufactured in countries that aren't friends of this country, we need to be careful about the protection of that supply chain. 
Yeah, I want to add something to, uh, I think, both um, Andy's and, and, and Rick's comment. You know, I think that, so, so there's always something to think about. There is the virtual and there's the physical, right? The An attack can be virtual and the impact can be virtual or physical, right, operational. Or the attack can be physical and the impact can be physical or virtual. The, and so there's a four by four matrix quadrant I use in my class to teach. And, and the riskiest is when the attack is virtual and the impact is physical or operational. And, and, and because then, remember the whole thing I talked about, the impact versus the cost. The cost of, of an attack that is virtual is, is, is not much at all, right? Somebody, someone sitting in some, some part of the planet can start creating these viruses and sort of spread them out. And then they start to shut things down. And the, the, the one, more phys, one more piece of it, which is that when you're dealing with virtual, you can, you know, you can either shut an equip, piece of equipment down, right? That's the direct virtual to physical, but you could do it indirectly. You could say, well, through this virtual means, I'm going to increase the power flow in the circuit. I'm going to increase demand response or decrease or interfere with demand response signals, or I'm going to have a car discharge instead of charging. And that type of an impact can be very, very, very detrimental. And, and th that's because of the fact we are dealing not just with machinery, we're dealing with power. So that so it makes it very very tricky um and i think that therefore cybersecurity is very very important and i think that built on there's actually a, a question on on your presentation um professor gadi about yeah how is the the aggregated nature of our distributed resources as we try and you know extract the potential of all the services that they can provide how does as we aggregate resources together, you know, you had mentioned, you know, that physical impact. Uh, and obviously, I assume that, that extends out the potential range of physical impacts, as well as the potential attack surface. Am I correct in that statement? Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's interesting, right? Yeah. So, so, of course, as you add more DERs, you add, if, you know, if there is a solar panel and a battery storage and an EV and other things behind every meter, right? I mean, behind the meters where there's a lot of assets going in. Um, you, of course, you have the attack vector goes up, right? But there's something very interesting happening in the technology field, which is that these smart sensors that are coming out, the ones at the edge of the network from which people can hack in, actually have AI and machine learning built into it. So you remember the slide I talked about where I said we can look at correlations between different types of, uh, uh, you know, power flows and things like that to actually try and figure out whether there is an attack has occurred or not. Well, guess what? If you could do that type of computation at the edge of the network, we can create a very smart edge where you can start to filter things out at every layer of, and, and starting with the edge. Now you think about it, you've got one layer of filter at the sensor level, one maybe at the network level, one at the aggregator level, uh, one at the DR level. So just like attack vectors are increasing, your ability with embedded software is actually going to help us make the grid more secure. Thank you. Um, so a question for you, Sarah. Um, there's a, a question about how do how do utility commissions use their regulatory powers um, to regulate, um, coordinate um, utilities. Uh, so that they are you know, addressing cybersecurity issues uh, in advance, perhaps you know, as they are bringing uh, proposals forward to the commission seeking cost recovery. You know, what tools do regulators like yourself have to ensure that you know, utilities are addressing cybersecurity vulnerabilities of any proposed um, software, hardware uh, upgrades? Well, thanks, Mark. Um, as I said, I think cybersecurity is a little bit of a different area for the PUCs. Um, we're more likely to reach out and talk with the utilities about the threats they're facing and the defenses they're putting up, and then the resiliency measures, because they're just as important. There, there is going to be success by the attackers at some point, and you want to make sure that you can recover quickly. So. We talk more about those things outside of the courtroom adjudicatory function um, that we normally are, are, are in. So that's one difference. But then 
we also have to figure out, and, and Vermont hasn't really had to face much of this, is how we're going to do cross, cost recovery. And Mark, you as moderator, maybe I'll speak to this too, because I think your paper goes into regulatory, um, you know, what are the different possibilities. On the one hand, some of the cybersecurity investments are a little different than normal investments because the predictability of them isn't quite the same as when, you know, they put in a poll. We know how long that's going to last. And it's, you know, it's not the threat to the poll isn't going to change very much. Oh, maybe climate change. But, you know, you kind of know what you're dealing with. With cybersecurity and cyber events, you don't know as much. You don't, you, there's not the predictability factor in terms of the benefits of that piece of equipment. The other thing is because they've had to do a lot of um, maybe maybe more more uh, cybersecurity measures, there might be a regulatory lag between when those are being put in and when they're going through a rate case. I think traditional uh, regulatory tools can work, but I do know that places are also looking at kind of investment riders and things that are a little different. We use alternative regulation for some things in Vermont, such as climate change measure, measures for one of our utilities. You know, we're going to see that, um, we're going to see more tools possibly emerge that could maybe address some of the differences that I see in cybersecurity investments. But I think you're very well equipped, even though you're the moderator, to address that as well. And of course, Rick, Rick is as well. Thank you. I'm going to add a little bit in about that. It's one of, in our report that we did, that was one of the reoccurring themes was the, the different nature of cybersecurity investments, that they are a much shorter time span, like five to seven years. There's a greater risk of redund redundancy. I think if you think about building something physical and putting up a pole, well, the placement of a pole 10 miles away will not affect um, the effectiveness of that particular poll, but as you change the system itself and add in um, new technologies, um, you're unsure of how that will impact system functioning. And I think that uh, this could either be for, for Sarah or for Rick, I think, or even for uh, Professor Gaudi, how do we, we have legacy systems. We have to think about our energy systems. If the, the focus of today's symposium is about a transition, we're not switching from you know one day on a Sunday to Monday having something entirely new, we are we are moving, um, and with that we are having systems that can be 20, 30, 40 years old, and then we're building on top of them. Um, I think that that creates a a unique challenge um, of thinking about how new functions will affect old pieces of equipment. Um, and potentially create, again, rewards that exist, but also having some, some risks or vulnerabilities that might not have been previously uh, imagined. Um, I don't know if anyone has any, any comments on that. We have a, a couple of other questions. Um, so I'm gonna come back to, it was in Andy's original slide and someone had, had asked, if one of Andy's slides had come back and said, how do lawyers think like hackers and, and act like engineers? Um, so we'll start with Sarah and with Rick. I know that you both have been involved in setting up these kicks. You know, the, if it's in New England or New Jersey, you know, how, do you, how do you take lawyers and bring them into areas where they have to think about engineering problems and uh, technology? How do you, how do we bridge that so that people are fluent enough to ask a ask a question or know when they should go and ask the engineer? Um, well, I, well, I'll say I'll that happy. there definitely is training involved. I mean, there's a lot of background and training that has to be done uh, to help uh, regulators come up to speed on all of these things. And in the end, you know, we also rely on experts coming in and talking with us, but Rick hasn't had a chance to talk for a while, so I'll let him have a word in edgewise. That's generous. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I, I, it's not that I need to talk, but uh, appreciate the indulgence. I'll just say a couple things on this. So, 
you, you actually raised a question that sort of implicated a couple of things. The first of which is, um, how do we, uh, you know, think about this new world generally? This this, this new this new grid, um, and a lawyer, whether it's a lawyer or a, a, a financial person or an operations person's a person in the industry, um, uh, whatever the role is, uh, I would say you need to stay vigilant and focused on asking those questions, just as Sarah said, to, to probe and think past their own position. Some of the survey information you'll recall, Mark, that we, we got indicated that there was a disconnect between the CISOs, the chief secure, information security officers in many utilities, and their operational people. Uh, one side thought there was a problem and vulnerabilities, and the other said, ah, let's not worry about it. People need to be talking and actively asking the questions in an enterprise, whether they're in the uh, a utility or whether they're in a regulator or a policymaker about what those vulnerabilities are and how we address them. And are we really addressing them appropriately? Uh, that's the first thing. And the second is information sharing generally. Uh, Sarah and uh, her colleagues in New England are clearly doing a great job with the, the regional information sharing uh, enterprise, they've stood up. Many states have done that. And as you mentioned in New Jersey, we did stand up a specific 24 uh, seven uh, fusion center that had has all industry participants, whether they're a utility, a bank, a hospital, providing information into that information sharing enterprise and then going back out to all of the members and that these are these are businesses all throughout the state. So that information sharing across subsectors is very important. And for uh, lawyers who are going to be practicing in the area in any of those verticals, any of those uh, industry enterprises should be thinking across and beyond their own work on how these protective measures and uh, and uh, methods like information sharing can be employed to better protect us. If you don't mind, um, since you invoked the, my earlier my earlier comment to trigger that round, I'll just say, if you, if you allow, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, speaking to speaking to lawyers or any any practitioners who aren't actual security people, and for whom the technology is uh, mesmerizing. Just so you know, even the security people with a technical background are overwhelmed by the complexity, and they don't really understand how things are working these days either. When, when Rick mentioned uh, uh, too many solutions coming at you at one time, uh, it's really hard to secure what you don't even understand uh, because we've let it get so complex. But, by, but by a point I think that is straightforward enough for uh, regular people uh, to understand is to um, make sure you have a plan B or make sure your utility has a plan B. If you buy all these new cool things uh, for, you know, usually for good reasons, efficiency or flexibility or cost savings. Um, what's, your, what's your plan B? Uh, if and when something goes wrong uh, or you lose confidence in a system, do you have a fallback plan? It's uh, certainly valid for ransomware. Uh, what is your backup plan for if you lose access to your applications or your critical data? I'm sure these days that everyone is practicing that, right? That they're ensuring that their most important stuff is backed up in a way that's pretty inconvenient. That way the ransomware can't get to it and encrypt it as well. But for other systems in a utility, um, what, how, do they, how, do they, how do they make sure that they're not completely dependent on systems that, could, uh, that they could lose? And how do they plan to have resilience when that day comes? Could be from a storm, could be from cyber, could be, could be from a squirrel. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's the plan B? Mark, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in uh, about an hour before uh, we got on to this uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, my my power went out at, at my house here in my home office and uh, um, thankfully it was restored. But um, I quickly thought that I'd very have to move to another part of the house that where the lighting was better and use an iPad to sign on to this webinar today. And Andy's absolutely right be thinking beyond the uh, particular initial issue and how you become more resilient generally 
and think about the alternatives and the, how these vulnerabilities can play out. Thank you, Rick. Um, so we are we are coming to the the end of our panel, and then an, an excellent conversation. I think we've we've learned how to think like lawyers and and, and hackers and engineers, um, and just some fabulous information being shared. And I think that each one of you has given us some resources to to go out and and, and think about. I believe that if the people can want to go back, they can look at their. Or where contact information is available or, or websites, I would direct you to look at those. Um, this is an area of where more people are needed and more attention is needed. I think to truly understand uh, the scope of the problem and then also developing solutions that get implemented as we build through the energy transition, um, both in, in new technology and adapting existing systems to be more secure, um, to be more resilient, uh, to think about what the plan B is and whether it's securing critical systems, ensuring that basic functions uh, are available. As Sarah had mentioned, you, you have three days and then things tend to get a little bit weird for uh, how well our, our society will, folk, will function. So um, if we have this on our mind, when we think about the energy transition, we can you know, protect uh, the systems that we have and develop new systems um, and ensure that services continue to be delivered throughout that. Um, so I'm getting the one last recommendation from a panelist. Um, that's everybody to go vote if you haven't already done that. Um, as a Canadian living in the United States, I can't do that, but I can encourage everyone who is legally <laughs> eligible to vote to go do so. I'd also remind you if you stay on, stay on the channel um, in about two or three minutes, you'll be hearing our concluding remarks. Um, from Antonia and from Austin. Um, but I'd like to thank all the panelists um, for an excellent hour plus. Uh, and hopefully this conversation will continue on. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Attendees. Bye, everyone.